Hi, John Morgan here with the Keep Growing Podcast. This episode starts off 93 million miles away from Earth and thousands of years ago in the core of our sun. Wait, what? Okay, okay, stick with me. Deep in the core of our sun, the tremendous pressure of gravity is so great that hydrogen gets squished together to form helium through nuclear fusion. This reaction releases vast amounts of energy. Part of that energy released is photons, or light. But the core of the sun is just so dense that it actually slows down the photons from their usual speed of 186,000 miles per second to just a snail's pace. They bounce off other atoms, swirl around in convection currents, and slowly make their way to the surface over thousands of years. Then they finally go zipping out of the corona at the speed of light, covering the 93 million miles to Earth in about 8 minutes. Then they come rocketing through the atmosphere, and if they're lucky and they don't hit a particle, like maybe a piece of dust or something in the upper atmosphere, they might just hit a plant's leaf. And if they're red or blue, they might get absorbed. Green gets reflected, that's why plants are green. Anyhow, when the photons get absorbed, they excite molecules in the chloroplasts. I'm so excited. And that triggers a whole chain reaction that takes CO2 and water and forms glucose in the process we know as photosynthesis. Oh man, I nearly blacked out there. The science just took over for a minute. Anyhow, in this episode, we're taking a look at the importance of light and photosynthesis. It's a pretty complex process, and that's a topic for another podcast. I thought about going into more depth with it in this episode, just so I could talk about the light-independent processes, because they're also known as the dark reactions. And I really just wanted to say, the dark reactions. But again, we've got bigger fish to fry, like how to choose the right lighting for your plants. Lighting is one of the most important aspects of gardening. Some plants love sunlight, but will perform poorly or die in the shade. Likewise, some plants are more suited to the shade and will just cook in full sun. Then there's plants like fall mums, whose blooming is dependent on the length of the day. When the days get shorter in the fall, it triggers them to produce blooms. With all the possibilities, where do we even start? Well, for the home gardener, a good place to start is taking a look at seed packs and plant tags. In the planting instructions, it will generally say what the light requirements are for a plant, something like full sun, part sun, or shade. However, those descriptions can be interpreted in a bunch of different ways. And it's something that people in our industry seem to think people will just magically know when they come into a garden center. So here's what those terms actually mean. So for full sun, the plant will need at least six hours of direct sunlight per day. And sometimes the symbol you'll see on a plant tag is a completely yellow sun. Part sun or part shade, these are plants that require three to six hours of sunlight. And sometimes the symbol you'll see is a sun with half of it colored yellow and half of it grayed out. And finally, there's shade or full shade. These plants can survive with less than three hours of sunlight a day. And sometimes the symbol you'll see is a sun that's completely grayed out. So plants require or tolerate different amounts of shade. And understanding these differences is important for planting your garden. Many plants are adapted to growing in shady areas, and therefore they're more sensitive to light. And many shade plants we grow are descendants of plants that are native to forest floors and the margins of wooded areas. And they're more efficient at utilizing what sunlight they can get. So, Shade, it's kind of important, and there's actually different types of shade to consider. Dappled shade is produced by trees and creates an ever-moving pattern of sun and shade. So high canopy trees or small leaf trees such as honey locusts provide this type of shade. It provides the widest range of gardening options for growing both shade 
and sun-loving plants. Then there's open shade, and the best description of this is something like a north-facing yard. The shade is often cast by a wall, a fence, or a building, and the amount of shade is determined by the season, making it a challenge for selecting plants for this type of shade. Uh, plants get no more than three or four hours of shade per day. Then there's medium shade. Medium shade is created where open shade is further obscured by trees in the landscape. Medium shade also occurs under decks and south-facing entrances. Plants get about four to six hours of shade per day. And then there's dense shade. It's the deepest type of shade, and it's found where tall walls and fences block out all but the narrowest strips of light. Dense shade can occur under trees with dense foliage, such as maples and some conifers. And plant selection for dense shade is very limited and sod thinning can be a big problem in these areas. So with all these different types of lighting conditions, there's a huge number of factors to consider when planning a garden. In upcoming episodes, we're going to cover some tips and tools that can help you plan your landscape to fit your space and your personal style. However, the light needs of prospective plants is one of the most important considerations that you need to make. Now that we've talked about sunlight and shade, what about areas where the sun don't shine? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Get your head out of the gutter. I'm talking about growing plants indoors. This is where artificial lighting comes in. Would you be surprised that using grow lights dates all the way back to the 1880s? I was when I was researching this episode. Back in 1880, C.W. Siemens conducted an economic analysis on using electric lighting for commercial plant production. 140 years later, and futuristic LEDs are taking over the horticulture industry because of their ability to produce the exact wavelengths of light that plants need and their insane energy efficiency. I recently reached out to Kim Kendall at Sunblaster in Langley, British Columbia, Canada to see how the plant light industry is evolving and also discuss how you can use plant lights at home to take your gardening game to the next level. Let's take a listen. All right, so I'm here today with Kim Kendall from Sunblaster, and they make uh, grow lights for indoor growing and all the way up through uh, larger greenhouse operations. So Kim, could you tell me a little bit about yourself and a little bit about Sunblaster? Sure. Sunblaster started out about 12 years ago. Um, we were primarily selling uh, T5 fluorescent lighting into the hydroponic market, um, and we got very well established in, in that market. About two and a half years ago, we were the, the company that we were with, they sold off our lighting division, and we're now a standalone um, horticultural lighting company, and we've expanded into um, compact fluorescent grow bulbs, and we've gone big into uh, LED light strips, um, and then we also have a kind of a matching plastics program where we sell trays and domes um, all the way from a home gardener series up to uh, uh, commercial use. So. It's, it's been an interesting evolution and a, and a kind of a neat, um, a neat progression here. Um, myself, I'm a third generation greenhouse brat. So my grandfather had greenhouses, mom had greenhouses, and I was kind of slave labor in both those operations and I swore I'd never have a greenhouse. And lo and behold, I opened up a greenhouse garden center and uh, now my son, my oldest boy, has taken over from that. Dad thought he could semi-retire, and Sunblaster came uh, waving their finger at me, and they said, we need you, um, you've got a horticultural background, we need a tester, we need a, an experimenter. So besides answering the phone and, and um, managing the warehouse, I have uh, in the office behind me, I have a large grow room where we have 
tons of racks and shelving and we're testing um, our lights and our products and our competitors products um, and we're trying to recreate the successes that we know the customers are going to have with our products and we try to create some of the disasters and sort of the negative things that might happen for especially for the new uh, the new folks we we take that information we translate it into um, customer service uh, manuals and write-ups so that folks answering the phone or our salespeople can can come up with the proper uh, answer we have commercial uh, CEA controlled environment agriculture um, operations that we deal with on a daily basis I just got off the phone with a company in Iowa who is having a little problem with his uh, lettuce and it turned out it it was he was blaming the lights and it was a classic calcium deficiency. As soon as I saw his pictures, um, it was like, hello, your calcium's not quite right. So in a, in a day's journey, I do all kinds of interesting things. Our, our lights are in everything from a kitchen counter to a large warehouse with thousands of our lights and millions of plants. And, um, and then I get to talk to the good folks at Bob's Market. So it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you mentioned kind of the wide range of growing. Um, what are uh, some of the different types of lighting available uh, for growing indoors? Well, mainly what we what we have. Um, I mean, you can grow to some not bad degree uh, under a an incandescent hundred watt bulb, or you could grow under um you know a, a traditional fluorescent um light fixture any light getting down to the soil level is is a good thing uh so when i say t5 that that's a very small compact high output fluorescent um and what we try to do with that um it has a 6400k uh rating that's a kelvin rating and it's just a scientific term that describes the spectrum that we're trying to match and that's the spectrum of a noonday sun without harmful UVA rays uh, and without harmful uh, infrared rays. So if you stuck a, and I'm going to sound all scientific here, a spectral radiometer outside at noon and it'll graph out a really cool looking spectrum and then if you put it underneath our lights we almost mimic it um, perfectly. So we're we're doing that with our T5s. We've brought along um, the compact fluorescence, and the best way to describe those, it looks like a standard light bulb. It's got a standard socket on the bottom, but on on the top, on the bulb part, it's a twisted uh, fluorescent that kind of looks like a uh, uh, an ice cream cone, a soft ice cream cone. It, it's got that kind of twisted shape, and People are using those for spotlighting. They're using them for hanging over, you know, a single tray or single plant. And they go from a, a low of a 13 watt all the way up to a high of a 200 watt. And um, the 200 watt, you pretty much have to wear heavy duty sunglasses because those things are so bright. So after we got those successfully installed into the market, now there's the big um, technology rush, I guess you'd call it, of, of LEDs. And we stayed, we stayed true to what's worked very, very well for us with the 6400K. And we actually sourced um, our chips that make up our LED lights are from a company in Japan called Nochia. And we pay a premium because they're the best chips in the world, but we get a a really superior product and a, and a perfect 6400K uh, light spectrum out of those chips. And um, what we're finding now with the with the LEDs versus our T5s, uh, the, the T5 being a fluorescent, all fluorescents are not that great on energy efficiency. So our T5s are in the 70 to 72% efficiency use of power. Our um, LEDs are in the 99% range, um, e extremely efficient with the use of power, and you're, you're getting the same light for uh, a lot less 
um, power cost, I guess would be the best way to describe it. And our T5s are rated um, 10,000 hours. If you've, if you've got folks going into any of the Bob's marketplaces, they'll see the bulbs and it'll say 10,000 hour rating. What, what that basically means is the spectrum that that light emits will be perfect for 10,000 hours. And then after 10,000 hours, the bulb starts to wear down a bit. It'll still shine really good, but, but the spectrum coming out starts to degrade 1% or 2% um, after that each year. LEDs, again, an advantage, they're 50,000 hours before that starts to happen. So you do have a little more cost with the LEDs, but um, uh, they are cheaper, cheaper to run. So it... it you know, we, we gear our lighting in our systems um, to as simple or as complex as, as, a, as a growing operation requires. Uh, in, in the case of the home gardener, our, our T5s and our compact fluorescence, um, we have millions of units throughout North America right now, and, and they do really, really, really good for that, that kind of grower. And then we have several million more out all the way up into the commercial units, and um, they do really well. So we kind of cover all, all markets with, with the products. In our last podcast episode, we talked about seed and starting seed indoors. And using a grow light is an important part of that, especially in the early springtime. Um, what suggestions would you have for people starting seeds indoors? Um. Most common question I, I I get is you know, well do I do I have to have a tray? Do I have to have one of your gardens? Do I you know they they get all panicky and and I and I just basically tell people you know what, um, if you have a carton of eggs and you've used up all the eggs out of the carton and it's uh, either a styrofoam or a, or a pressed fiber material, those little sockets that the eggs sit in. You put dirt in those, put a little water on it, it'll grow stuff like crazy. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've shown people in, in talks and, and classes that we do, I've got yogurt containers and um, sour cream containers and, you know, all kinds of different things that I've actually um, started plants in and growing plants. So it's, it's as simple or as complex as you choose to make it. We've kind of gone a little step easier for folks and we have our little mini greenhouse kits and what that is is a, a standard 10 inch by 20 inch nursery tray um, it's got a seven inch high nano dome over it so a clear plastic dome and then it has some weird grooves in the top that allow um, our t5 combo light to actually sit on top of the on top of the dome and and put the light into where the plants need to start so you can start that way. Um, uh, a lot of times I get asked, people People will say, well, you know, the soil is kind of staying wet and it's, and it's kind of cold. Seeds kind of like a little bit of heat from the bottom. If you're fortunate um, and have a kitchen where there's no cupboards over, to, over the fridge, put your, put your seed trays or your little egg trays or whatever you're starting stuff in on top of that fridge and the warmth from the fridge operating um, will be just perfect for starting starting seeds. It'll keep the soil warm. It'll make make the seeds happy. And the big thing that I have impressed with people is you you can't you can't have um, a perfect expectation every single time. I've learned more from you know, glorious failures than, than I ever did from, you know, hitting it out of the ballpark every single time. So the best thing with seeds, the best thing with plants, my grandfather used to say, plants suffer fools gently. Um, if you screw up, throw some more seed in or, you know, change where the plant's growing. I mean, there's no hard, set, fast rules about who's doing it right or who's doing it wrong. The plants will tell you. If you, if you learn to watch your plants and you learn to watch the seedlings, little things like um, if your light that you choose to use is too high above the seedling tray, you'll see the plants actually stretching. Bring that light down a little closer. 
and the plants will stay a little more um, basal and they, they kind of stretch sideways instead. A um, little air movement is always good. Uh, if, it's, if it's a little too moist, a little too damp, um, you run the risk of a um, little problem called damp off and uh, your, your little seedlings come up and then they get kind of a little fuzzy fuzzy um, connection at the soil level and, and they fall over. And that's just basically, you know, lack of air circulation. So if you put it somewhere where it gets a little air movement or throw a little fan close to it, that, that helps. And then um, most people overwater too much. So they, they put their seeds in whatever container and uh, they soak the daylights out of the soil and if the seeds start coming up, they get all excited and soak it some more and soak it some more. And, and all of a sudden I get a phone call, hey, my seeds are all looking terrible. And most times it's just, you know, they've watered them too much and they've drowned them. Um, you've killed them with kindness, basically. So we always recommend if you go to the nursery, grab one of their little mister bottles, um, you know, and just mist stuff gently. And, and that's more than enough moisture for a, t a tiny, tiny seedling. When we have our domes over top of a tray, um, we'll initially we'll wet the soil and make sure the soil is, is um, moderately moist, I guess would be the best description. And then we'll plant our seeds in, put the tray on, and we'll wait for, it gets all kind of misty and sweaty inside the dome. And then subsequent waterings don't really happen. We just lift the dome a little bit and squirt it with the, with the mister. And usually that's good for a couple of days. So stuff um, works in that little sweaty, condensed environment really, really nicely. And you don't overwater and your seeds get a nice, a nice start. And the humidity is good for the tender plants. And uh, away you go. It's, it's just that simple. If somebody wants to expand beyond just starting seeds indoors, that they want to have, say, a little kitchen herb garden or even growing something like leaf lettuce indoors, what suggestions would you have for kind of growing and progressing and, and using grow lights to really grow stuff inside? Well, we, um, I mean, there's, you, you could you could start your seedlings um, in a tray in in my previous mention you know egg carton um, once they get big enough you can transplant them into some small pots uh, you know put a light above them or suspend a light above them uh, or you go to the point of um, things like we we have a a company called Garland that that we supply the lights for and they make uh, micro grow light gardens and uh, a large version called a grow light garden and it's a self-contained unit has lights in the in the lid that that slides up and down on two support posts mm -hmm. the, they have either four little or four large depending which unit you get uh, pots that sit on a wick mat and the bottom of the unit is a is a water reservoir so um, the wick mat uh, sucks the water out of out of the reservoir and kind of keeps your soil moist. The lights are above it, and you can slide them down when they're little and move them up. And we have people producing lettuce and uh, thyme and uh, you know other herbs uh, all the time in in um, in their kitchens and in their dining rooms. We have restaurants that use these units that they like the. They're very classy looking, very um, very much fit in a kitchen environment, and um, they they look really good on on uh, on a shelf in the restaurant. And the chef comes out and snips off little little um, <laughs> micro seedlings and things and puts it on the salad. And so it it gives you the ability to get a little bigger. If you're going bigger again, um, we use the uh, uh, chrome baker's racks. And uh, we'll set our trays and our pots on the baker's racks, and we suspend our lights off off the uh, bottom of the of the shelf above. And I mean, they're available in the in the hardware stores, in the building supplies, the uh, um, Costco's, WalMarts. They all they all carry them, and they're really versatile. They're on wheels. The shelves adjust. Um, you know they don't they don't get dirty they don't show wear and tear um people will use those 
again, in a, in a spare room or in a, a dining room and, and it looks really good, you get really modern and plug it all into one little timer and uh, it'll turn it on and turn it off for you so that you don't have to worry about getting the timing right. And uh, you you can expand you know from there further if you want, or mm-hmm. um, just keep it at that point. Uh, a four foot baker's rack will hold 20 flats of of plants. Um, you can you can if you're doing microgreens, for instance, 20 flats in two weeks. Um, you would have 20 flats of greens easy. Uh, that's a lot of a lot of nutritional punch to add to your to your uh, dinners, what a lot of people will do is keep two or three flats of microgreens, two or three flats of leafy greens. They start mixing it up, and and uh, maybe one shelf is just um, all herbs that are wanting to stay a little drier, and it just gives you a little more versatility. So, again, it's as small as you'd like or as large as you'd like. Um, that's some great information. Um, if people have any other questions, how can they uh, reach you or some blaster with questions so we are um on the on the great internet uh we are sunblasterlighting.com and on on our site there's a ton of information but there's also an area where people can um uh, put in a, a request or a question and they hit the send button and it and it basically comes through to my desk <laughs> um and we we answer you know the questions and get back to you as fast as we can. Um, We also, we're in Canada, um, so we have a, uh, um, you can call our our office number, it's area code 604-381-1166. That will get you into the switchboard and somebody nice will answer the phone and refer you to to me or, you know, one of our other techs that are here um, and we can answer questions that way. We have distributors carrying our product throughout United States and Canada. Um, so we, you know, our distributors, if, if they happen to be a commercial customer, the distributors can answer questions. I know the folks at Bob's Market carry our product and, and they can answer questions on, on the, on the uh, units as well. Um, we kind of work on the basis that there's no such thing as a foolish question. Um, they're all important. We like answering them. We like setting people's mind at ease. And we also like encouraging people to grow stuff because uh, we need to grow more more of our own food. Uh, so uh, we totally encourage uh, getting the calls. And we enjoy it because we learn about, you know, what people are doing and where. And, um, you know, I, I talk to people every day from South Carolina and Florida and California and um, all across Canada, and so it's it's really cool, and I get a, a a good sense of what our equipment's doing and where, and so I would totally encourage you know if, if you've got a question, please don't stew about it. Please get in touch with us. We will answer you as fast as we can. Again, I want to thank Kim for sharing this great information. After we had wrapped up the interview, we were talking about how light has an effect on us too. Personally, I suffer from seasonal affective disorder, and during the darkest part of the winter, I can start to get pretty depressed. However, I'm lucky that I work at a place where it's warm and sunny every single day of the year. All that I need to do is just step into one of our greenhouses. Let's end this episode with this week's gardening wisdom. It comes from the poet Alfred Austin. He writes... The glory of gardening, hands in the dirt, head in the sun, heart with nature. To nurture a garden is to feed not just the body, but the soul. For some more great information on the role light plays in gardening, and links, diagrams, and more about this episode, check out our show notes at bobsmarket.com slash keepgrowing. If you're listening on iTunes, Google Play, or other platforms, be sure to give us a review. You can also learn more about Bob's through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more. Check out Bob's Live, our weekly live broadcast on Facebook, where we explore what's happening in the greenhouse, my garden, or where we do gardening demonstrations. 
If you want to contact me directly with questions, comments, or smart remarks, shoot me an email at keepgrowing at bobsmarket.com. Until next time, keep growing. The music in this week's episode is by Lee Rosevear. Copyright 2018, Bob's Market and Greenhouses, Incorporated.